This whole religion is based upon three fundamental pillars. Belief in Allah, belief in the prophets, and belief in judgment day. These are the three fundamentals of all fundamentals. And so inshallah ta'ala today we will begin our discussion uh, about the reality of qiyamah and we'll discuss what we know about qiyamah and what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned of it from the beginning of qiyamah, meaning the trumpet being blown, up until the very end. Belief in Qiyamah is not only a fundamental of our faith, it is a fundamental of the Abrahamic faiths. And it is something that marks the Abrahamic faiths from the non-Abrahamic faiths. Because all of the religions of the world are divided into two primary categories, the Abrahamic and then the Dharmic religions. These two put together form the bulk of religions of the world. Anything outside of these two is very uh, incidental or small. The Abrahamic we know, Judaism, Christianity and Islam. And put together, these three faith traditions are more than half of the world's religions. The other major, major religions of the world are Hinduism and then of course Buddhism. These are the two big religions other than ours and then to a smaller level Jainism. And then you have the far eastern religions which uh, Shinto, Shintoism and whatnot. These are called the Dharmic religions. And the Dharmic religions share some things in common like the Abrahamic religions share some things in common. Of the fundamentals of all Abrahamic religions is belief in the God of Abraham and belief in the concept of prophets and belief in judgment day. These three are shared by all Abrahamic faith traditions. The Dharmic religions don't believe in any of these things. And the concept of judgment day does not exist amongst all of them. What is the equivalent in all Dharmic religions? Who could tell me? Very good. Reincarnation, right? Or the concept of liberation of the soul from the body. So the goal of those faiths, we're not going to talk about that, don't worry, I'm just, this is one of our, one of our first tangents of today. The goal of those religions is to break free from the cycle of reincarnation, nirvana or mokshi or something. But the point is, by the way, they don't believe in a day of judgment. But do those faiths believe in some type of judgment? Yes. Because that's the whole point of karma. That's the whole point of reincarnation. Even those faith traditions have some kernel of judgment. But it's not one judgment day. It is Every soul shall have its own judgment and then the resurrection of the next will be based upon what it has done. So the point being, at some level, judgment is universal to all faith traditions of this world. Except that the Abrahamic faiths believe in one day. That is the day of Hisab, the day of resurrection, the day of Qiyamah, Yawm al -Din. And the other faith traditions, they have their other uh, interpretations. And by the way, I say the Abrahamic faith traditions and all major sects of Christianity and all mainstream groups of Islam, as I mentioned the very last episode of the Barzakh, all of them believe in an Akhirah. Interestingly enough, for reasons beyond the scope of our class, the Jewish faith tradition has veered from this belief. Once upon a time, classical Judaism, early Judaism, did believe in Qiyamah. And Allah references this in the Quran. They did believe in heaven and hell. However, over the course of the evolution of, of, uh, of Jewish theology, slowly but surely this concept was not fully discarded, but it is no longer central to the belief of most uh, modern Jews. Some still believe in it and many have abandoned it and most of them are agnostic about it. They don't know what even the religious, even the, the practicing amongst them, this has something that is now by and large not uh, mainstream amongst them which is very interesting. They have abandoned this belief. Nonetheless, that's the introduction. Now let's get to the Islamic stuff. When we look at the Quran, belief in Qiyamah is one of the most fundamental principles of the entire religion. Some of our scholars have said, and there is an element of truth to this, you cannot read a single page of the Qur'an except that Allah explicitly references Qiyamah on it. And I didn't go over, over, over every page, but there's definitely an element of truth here. You cannot read a single page of the Qur'an except that there is an indirect or a direct reference to the Qiyamah. And in fact, one of the interesting things about the concept of Qiyamah is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala argues in the Qur'an with those who deny Qiyamah. Allah azza wa jal reasons with them. He uses rational arguments. He's 
essentially trying to prove Qiyamah in many different ways. And so we began our talk about Qiyamah by looking at some of the primary techniques that Allah uses in the Qur'an to prove the Qiyamah. Some of the rational arguments, and it's interesting that Allah is using rational arguments here. Some people believe rationality has no role in the religion, and this is not true. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is using logical arguments. He's telling people who reject the Qiyamah to think that there is a Qiyamah. And he reasons with them in a logical manner, in a manner that he's trying to prove. And this is because the Quraysh, generally speaking, rejected a Qiyamah. The Quraysh didn't believe in a Qiyamah. They believed in Allah, but they didn't believe in prophets, and they didn't believe in Qiyamah. So they rejected two of the main three pillars of Islam. So the Quran proves prophets in many ways, but more than the prophets, because the Qiyamah is discussed more than triple the amount the prophets are discussed. More than the prophets, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the Qiyamah and attempts to prove its existence to the uh, people who rejected it. So today, inshallah ta'ala, the first part, we will discuss seven specific techniques, and this is also a summary. We could, there is a very good book in Arabic, a very large book about how Allah Azza wa proves the Qiyamah in the Qur'an. So this is a summary, and I have chosen seven of the arguments. The first genre, each one of these is a genre. Under, under them are hundreds of verses. So every point has hundreds, not one or two examples, hundreds of examples. The first genre of evidences, the first technique that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses is simply to say that it is true. So this is not rational as much as it is, you need to believe in it because I'm saying so. And of course, this is the bulk of the verses, Maliki Yawmiddin, the master of judgment day, or the judge of judgment day, or the lord of judgment day. This is a statement of fact. Allah Azza wa Jal is mentioning, included in this are thousands, not hundreds, thousands of verses that describe the Qiyamah. Look at Surat, or look at Juz Amma. The majority of verses of Juz Amma are about Qiyama. Amma tasa'alun an al naba il azim, right? Either Shamsu Kuwirat, wa either Nujumun Kadarat, wa either Jibalu Suirat, wa either Al Isharu Uttirat, wa either Wuhu. What is it all about? So the bulk of all of these small surahs, many of the verses of the Meccan era, Allah is describing Qiyamah. When families will be split up. So this comes under the first genre that Allah Azza wa Jal is telling you is going to happen and Allah is describing it. And of these verses, Allah says in the Quran, They ask you, is the judgment day true? وَيَسْتَنْبِئُونَكَ They're asking you the naba, they're asking you, أَحَقٌ هُ Is it really true? And Allah says, one of the most powerful emphases in the Qur'an, قُلْ إِي وَرَبِّي إِنَّهُ لَحَقٌ Say, indeed, by my Lord, verily, it is true. If you deconstruct this verse, there's five ways of emphasizing. But one of the most emphatic verses in the Qur'an about Qiyamah, they ask you, is the Qiyamah true? قُلْ إِي وَرَبِّي إِنَّهُ لَحَقْ There's actually seven, six or seven ways, not five. Where Allah Azza wa is emphasizing over and over again, say verily, I tell unto you, emphasizing, it is true. So the first genre is basically to say that it is happening and to describe it's happening. This is not reasoning, this is simply, I'm telling you it's going to happen. If you believe in me, then it's going to happen. The second genre, which is a common motif of the Qur'an. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells mankind to think about their own origin. And in thinking about their own origin, Allah is saying, don't you think I can bring your origin and do it all over again? The one who created you for the first time, can he not recreate you again? So this is a logical, this is a reasoning. Why are you surprised that I can resurrect the dead? Didn't I create you from nothing? Right? So there are again hundreds of verses in the Quran about uh, this genre, this evidence. Doesn't mankind see where he comes from? Then what? When Allah describes where you came from, and Allah describes the process of the evolution of the embryo. Then Allah says, إِنَّهُ عَلَىٰ رَجْعِهِ لَقَادِرٌ Don't you think I can do this all over again and bring you back? This is a direct rational appeal. 
The one who created you in this manner can recreate you again. And in the end of Surah Yasin, أَوَلَمْ يَرَى الْإِنسَانُ أَنَّا خَلَقْنَاهُ مِن نُطْفَةٍ فَإِذَا هُوَ خَصِيمٌ مُبِينٌ Doesn't mankind see that we created him from a drop of fluid? And lo and behold, we created him from this fluid. Now he is arguing with us. What is he arguing about? Go back to the seerah. Go back to the seerah. Ubay ibn Khalaf came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He had in his hands a bone from an animal. And he said, Ya Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, And he crumbled up whatever he could crumble up. Do you think Allah will bring this bone back to life when it has decayed? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answered him by revealing the end of Surah Yasin. And it is such a powerful answer. This man who is arguing with us that whether we can bring life back or not, where did he come from? Now that he is Khasim Mubin, has he forgotten his own origin? He challenges us even as he forgets his own creation. In other words, you're asking Allah for an external proof and you are a walking internal living proof. What proof do you need when you are the proof itself? You dare ask Allah for a challenge and your creation is itself the proof of the challenge. وَضَرَبَ لَنَا مَثَلًا وَنَسِيَ خَلْقًا قَالَ مَنْ يُحْيِي الْعِظَامَ وَهِيَ رَمِيمٌ This is what Ubay said. Then Allah Azza wa Jal says, قُلْ يُحْيِيهَا الَّذِي أَنْشَأَهَا أَوَّلَ مَرَّةً the one who created it the first time can recreate it again. This is a logical argument that Allah Azza wa Jal is uh, bringing. And Allah Azza wa Jal says in the Quran, وَهُوَ الَّذِي يَبْدَأُ الْخَلْقَ ثُمَّ يُعِيدُهُ وَهُوَ أَهْوَنُ عَلَيْهِ And he is the one who began the creation. And then he shall repeat it all over again. And this is a very profound and interesting verse that has caused some discussion amongst our ulama. The phrase, and it shall be easier for him. وَهُوَ أَهْوَنُ عَلَيْهِ What shall be easier? To recreate. Why is this verse potentially problematic to some theologians? Hmm? Yeah, this is the point. Nothing is difficult for Allah. For Allah to say, and I shall recreate as I did it the first time, and the second time shall be easier for me. As if the first time was difficult. Ibn Abbas responded to this very easily. And he said, if there was a difficulty, then when you do it for a second time, it is easier. But there was no difficulty to begin with. And Allah Azza wa Jal is simply making them understand. If you think there was any difficulty, surely to do it again is easier than to do it for the first time. So Allah is speaking to them at their level. And He is saying, if you feel that that's going to be difficult, surely when some, somebody does anything for a second time, it is easier. So in the realm of Allah, nothing is difficult. He says, Kun fayakun. But if there were to have been an imaginary difficulty. Surely, recreation is easier than first time. And this is something we all know when we do something a second time, it is easier. So this is the second genre. Under it are hundreds of verses where Allah links belief in judgment day with the origins of man. And Allah Azza wa Jal asks mankind to go back to his own creation and to understand that how was he created, so too he shall be recreated. The third genre of verses, also many, many hundreds of verses, or I should say maybe dozens of verses under this one, is to tell mankind to examine the whole world around them, the heavens and earth. So the second, to examine yourself. The third, to examine the ecosystem, to examine the heavens and the earth. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions many of these verses that أَوَلَيْسَ الَّذِي خَلَقَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضَ بِقَادِرٍ عَلَىٰ أَنْ يَخْلُقَ مِثْلَهُمْ Don't you see that the one who creates the heavens and the earth is capable of creating or recreating something similar unto that? 
And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَوَلَمْ يَرَوْا أَنَّ اللَّهَ الَّذِي خَلَقَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضَ وَلَمْ يَعْيَ بِخَلْقِهِنَّ بِقَادِرٍ عَلَىٰ أَنْ يُحْيَهَ الْمَوْتَىٰ Don't they see the one who has created the heavens and the earth and he wasn't powerless in creating them. He wasn't, it wasn't difficult to create them. Don't they see the one who created the heavens and the earth with such ease is also capable of bringing the dead back to life. Once again, explicit linkage. Look at the world around you, see the heavens and the earth, and realize Allah Azza wa Jal is capable of all things. So this is the third genre, and that is as samawati wal ard. The fourth genre, you can say 3A even, or I put a number four, specific natural elements within the samawati wal ard. Specific aspects of the creation around us that Allah in particular asks us to examine and Allah Azza wa Jal says look at this aspect the one who is able to do that is able to bring life back to the dead give me an example of genre number four because under this are many categories many examples what's the most common example in the Quran that Allah says to examine around us bringing dead vegetation or dead land back to life now this is something that I did not fully understand growing up in America until I lived in Saudi Arabia. Because in America we have a different type of soil. Generally speaking, even in the winter our soil is green. Even if it's not the same type of greenery, but it's a different type of soil. When you go to a barren land, when you go to a desert land, you see a different type of soil. And you have to see it to believe it. Where throughout the year, it is a complete barren, not a single leaf grows on it. Then a specific season comes, the rain season, and all of a sudden that land that you could have swore is never going to produce any fruit, it becomes greener than a dense jungle. And I've seen this with my own eyes. It's unbelievable the change that happens. There's a certain time where the amount of waterfalls is perfect and that dead land is resurrected back to life. And this is something that the Arabs living in that environment would have seen regularly. So Allah Azza wa Jal mentions that many times in the Quran. For example, فَانْظُرْ إِلَىٰ آثَارِ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ كَيْفَ يُحْيِي الْأَرْضَ بَعْدَ مَوْتِهَا كَذَٰلِكَ يُحْيِي اللَّهُ الْمَوْتَىٰ Look, Allah is saying, at the effects of Allah's mercy, meaning the effects, mercy here means rain. Look at the effects of Allah's rain how he brings the dead land back to life, this is the same way I shall bring the mota back to life. And indeed, Allah is capable of all things. And this is at least a dozen or two dozen times in the Quran, Allah mentions the cycle of vegetation. And Allah mentions that leaves become yellow and then become green and become life again. This cycle, Allah says, you see it around you. Not just the land, but in vegetation. You see it around you. Why can't you recognize I can do the same for other species of life as well? Also, Allah mentions the cycle of water. Also, Allah mentions fire itself. So Allah is saying, this green tree, which is fed by blue water, it becomes this yellowish flame. Look at all of this cycle, the same thing. Allah Azza wa Jal mentions, surely I can also bring the dead back into the life as well. So the cycles of other species, other life forms on this earth, Allah is saying the one who can permutate those life forms, surely I can permutate your life form as well. So this is category four, where Allah asks us to look at specific aspects of the creation. Category five is a very, very interesting one. Very interesting one. Here, Allah Azza wa Jal uses a different tactic completely. Allah uses what modern philosophers have called the moral argument for the existence of God. This is uh, something that was propagated very recently, I think only two, three hundred years ago, if I'm not mistaken. It's a very recent uh, phenomenon of Western philosophy, but the Quran mentions it uh, uh, in, in its revelation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the moral argument for judgment day. What is the moral argument for judgment day? That this life is inherently unfair. And if there were no judgment day, then that would not be a perfection of Allah's justice. This is an argument that Allah uses in the Quran. 
How can you deny a judgment day when there's no justice in this dunya? And Allah Azza wa Jal will not allow injustice to go unpunished. So the Quran uses the moral argument to prove the existence of Qiyamah. And Western philosophers only stumbled across this relatively recently. Allah knows maybe from the Quran directly. And then they have a different category of how to prove the existence of Allah. And for us, it is in the uh, Quran. There are a number of verses in this regard. Of them, Allah says in the Quran, أَفَنَجْعَلُ الْمُسْلِمِينَ كَالْمُجْرِمِينَ مَا لَكُمْ كَيْفَ تَحْكُمُونَ This is a rhetorical question. A rhetorical question is a question whose answer is inherently within the question. It doesn't need to be verbalized. A rhetorical question is meant to emphasize an obvious truth. It is not meant to actually question. Right? This is a rhetorical question. And Allah Azza wa Jal uses a rhetorical question because it is too self-evident to even re- respond to it. So Allah says, أَفَنَجْعَلُ الْمُسْلِمِينَ كَالْمُجْرِمِينَ Do you think we will make the believers, like the criminals, the same? مَا لَكُمْ كَيْفَ تَحْكُمُونَ What is wrong with you? How are you judging? Allah is slapping some sense into people. Do you think that a good person and a bad person, that's it, they live and they die and that's it, nothing's going to happen to them? That's not fair. And in a more explicit verse, Allah says in the Quran, أَمْ نَجْعَلُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا صَالِحَاتِ كَالْمُفْسِدِينَ فِي الْأَرْضِ أَمْ نَجْعَلُ الْمُتَّقِينَ كَالْفُجَّارِ Even more explicit. Do you think we are going to make the one who was good and did good deeds the same as the one who caused fasad in the earth? who caused evil in the earth, who was a mass murderer, a brutal dictator? Do you think one who suffered and the one who caused the suffering, that their their life will be the same? In another verse, this is the third verse, the same their life and their death? How evil is the judgment that you make? How evil is it that a mass murderer gets away with it? And even if he is killed, what is one death compared to a million deaths that he caused? What is one jail term compared to destroying an entire country as so many brutal dictators have done? So Allah says, what is wrong with you? How can you not affirm a judgment day when you see there are people who are being treated unjustly, unfairly? When you see people live their lives in piety and they still, from our perspective, get the short end of the stick. They still might be harmed or they still die unjust deaths or even if they die a normal death. They didn't get the reward of their good. Where is the good for that this pious person has done? He lived his whole life in piety, and yet he's struggling, living a difficult life. And another person, born into wealth, living the life of a playboy, not caring about the akhirah, and maybe he lives a normal animalistic life and dies a normal death. Is that fair? That this person gets to enjoy this dunya, and he lived an evil life, and the righteous person was deprived of any good. So Allah Azza wa Jal, is telling us, How evil is your judgment to deny judgment day? How can you make this judgment? How can you judge that there's no judgment based upon the moral realities of the world that we live in? This is a very interesting argument to prove the day of judgment. And that is, this world does not have justice. There must be a place where there's infinite justice and the one who does good or the one who does evil shall taste the reward or the punishment for what they have done. Argument number six that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses. Genre number six. Again, remember, each one of these you will find many verses underneath. Genre number six is an argument that goes back to the divine wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That if there were no judgment day and there were no heaven and hell, then life would become what? Meaningless. Very good. Life would have no meaning. And Allah Azza wa Jal says in the Quran, أَفَحَسِبْتُمْ أَنَّمَا خَلَقْنَاكُمْ عَبَثَ وَأَنَّكُمْ إِلَيْنَا لَا تُرْجَعُونَ Qiyamah is linked with the concept of abath. Once again, there's a direct causal linkage. أَفَحَسِبْتُمْ أَنَّمَا خَلَقْنَاكُمْ عَبَثًا Did you think we created you as a joke? As a jest? To waste our time? Did you think 
your whole existence wasn't for a higher reason? And you, and you were not going to return unto us? Notice how Allah links belief in judgment with His wisdom. If Allah is all wise, there must be a judgment day. Simple as that. If Allah Azza wa Jal has hikmah, and obviously He has hikmah because of the creation around us. The creation around us necessitates Allah is alim and khabir and hakim. That Allah Azza wa Jal is perfectly wise. The one who is perfectly wise does not do things foolishly, does not waste time and energy in something useless. And so Allah Azza wa Jal is saying, we would not do something in vain. And again, there's a number of verses in this regard. The seventh genre of verses, the seven genre of verses is specific stories. Now, these stories we have to believe in. So this is, it goes back to point number one that we simply have to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, in this regard. That a number of people challenged Allah or asked Allah for proof to show them how resurrection occurs and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala demonstrated and then Allah tells us in the Quran about their stories now this is something that we simply have to believe in but again for those people who witnessed it it was a miracle for them for us it is a miracle we believe in and we didn't witness it can somebody give me one of these stories in the Quran what's the most obvious one go ahead brother Okay, which surah is it in? Surah Baqarah. Surah Baqarah. Surah Baqarah. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَوْ كَالَّذِي مَرَّ عَلَىٰ قَرْيَةٍ وَهِيَ خَاوِيَةٌ عَلَىٰ عُرُوشِهَا قال, What did he say? أَنَّا يُحْيِي هَذِهِ اللَّهُ بَعْدَ مَوْتِهَا How can Allah bring this entire city back to life after it is completely destroyed? So what did Allah do? فَأَمَاتَهُ اللَّهُ مِئَةَ عَامٍ ثُمَّ بَعْثَهُ Allah caused him to die, meaning sleep, because sleep is the brother of death. Remember, النَّوْمُ أَخُوْ الْمَوْتِ حَدِيثِ of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. فَأَمَاتَ اللَّهُ مِئَةَ عَامٍ ثُمَّ بَعْثَهُ Then Allah woke him up and caused him to to wake up from that. Right? قَالَ كَمْ لَبِثْتْ قَالَ لَبِثْتْ يَوْمَ وَبَعْضِ يَوْمَ The point is the story is well known, but Allah Azza wa Jal is demonstrating that He can resurrect the dead. He resurrected the donkey in front of him. This is one story. Another story. Surah Kahf, which one? The people of cave did not die. Ibrahim and the birds. Ibrahim and the birds. Which surah is that in? Also Baqarah. Also Baqarah. Right? What did Ibrahim say? Ibrahim is saying himself, Oh Allah, show me how do you resurrect the dead? And Allah says, Don't you believe? I believe, Oh Allah, but I just want to make my iman at ease, my heart at ease. Our Prophet وسلم, said, Hadith is in Bukhari, Nahnu we have more right to have skepticism than Ibrahim. Skepticism here does not mean we doubt. Skepticism here means that how will Allah do it? A wondrous skepticism, not a doubtful skepticism, right? There's a wondrous, how is it possible? Versus you cannot do it. There's a two different types. Of so Ibrahim had the first type. I want to see how you do it. I believe, I just want to see. And it will make my heart firm. So Allah Azza wa told him, you know the story, cut up the birds, put them on the different things, and then call them to you. Yes, They will come to you, racing back to you. So this is a second story, resurrection from the dead. A third story, what else? Isa ibn Maryam and the resurrection of, in the Christian scriptures called Lazarus, in front of everybody's eyes. Okay, a fourth story: Musa and the one who was murdered, and the slaughtering of the cow, the, 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 the cow, right, the heifer. Many stories of this nature, where people are resurrected from the actual dead, and other people see this. So this is something that for us we believe in, 
But for those who saw it, it is an actual physical demonstration of this reality. And uh, the famous Mufassir of the Quran, uh, Shaykh Shankiti, in his Adwa al Bayan, his famous tafsir that he wrote, he has a beautiful uh, summary of all of this in the tafsir of the Surah Al Baqarah. Ya ayyuhan nas, u'budu rabbakum ladhi khalaqakum wa ladhi qablikum la'alakum tattaqoon. That Shankiti says, and I'll just summarize, there's a whole page and a half here, that in these verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions three primary evidences of the resurrection of the dead. Number one, the fact that he created mankind. For he says, Worship your Lord who created you and those before you. And that is because the creation of man and the creation of the uh, 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 mankind basically is the greatest miracle and the greatest sign that he can create them all over again. For example, وَهُوَ الَّذِي يَبْدَأُ الْخَلْقَ ثُمَّ يُعِيدُهُ وَهُوَ أَهْوَنُ عَلَيْهِ I quoted this verse. And for example, كَمَا بَدَأْنَا أَوَّلَ خَلْقٍ نُعِيدُهُ This is Surat, uh, surat Al-Anbiya. كَمَا بَدَأْنَا أَوَّلَ خَلْقٍ نُعِيدُهُ As we created you the first time, we shall repeat it. And the verse in the Quran, فَسَيَقُولُونَ مَنْ يُعِيدُنَا They ask, who will bring us back to life? قُلِ الَّذِي فَطَرَكُمْ أَوَّلَ مَرَّةً Say the one who created you the first time. And the verse in the Qur'an, قُلْ يُحِيهَا الَّذِي أَنْشَأَهَا أَوَّلَ مَرَّةً Say the one who brought it the first time will bring you back. And the verse in the Qur'an, أَفَعَيِّنَا بِالْخَلْقِ الْأَوَّلِ بَلْ هُمْ فِي لَبْسِ مِنْ خَلْقٍ جَدِيدٍ Do you think that we were incapable of doing it the first time such that we cannot do it for the second time? And the verse in the Qur'an, يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسُ إِن كُنْتُمْ فِي رَيْبِ مِنَ الْبَعْثِ فَإِنَّا خَلَقْنَاكُمْ مِنْ تُرَابٍ And he goes on and on. Then he says, the second evidence is the creation of the heavens and earth. Which is mentioned in this surah, الَّذِي جَعَلَ لَكُمُ الْأَرْضَ فِرَاشًا وَالسَّمَاءَ بِنَاءً So Allah says, the one who made this earth a platform and the heavens a sky. And then he brings like 10 verses about this. And then he mentions the third one, which is the life cycle of the water. And he goes, all of these are evidences that Allah is reasoning with people that he will have a judgment day. Jayyid. So these are seven categories I mentioned.